Welcome to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum's Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I'm the coordinator of volunteers, public outreach, and programming at the museum. Thanks so much for joining us today, and thanks to those who have joined us for our previous virtual programs. Welcome back. Uh, over the past few weeks, we've been sharing Pennsylvania transit history topics and tales of our collection that you've been enjoying from the comfort of your home. This is the last show for this season of Trolleyology, but we are planning another round of shows for early 2021. And you can see the full list of upcoming presentations on our website at patrolley.org, which I can share in the chat box shortly. Now, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and turning off your videos for me, I'll come along and get anyone else who doesn't have them off in just a moment. Now, we have some viewers who have visited the museum before and some who volunteer here, but for those who might be new to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, we were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club, some of who will make cameos in the presentation tonight. The museum opened to visitors a few years later in 1963 and is actually located along the route of the trolley line between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. Here you'll find almost 50 trolleys and electric railway cars, about 20 of which operate, and around 30,000 visitors per year take the four-mile scenic ride at the museum. And now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenter, Jim Grabner. Um, Jim has spent his entire 60-year career in the transit industry working as a car builder, CEO of two major transit systems in Rhode Island and San Jose, where he says he got to model a streetcar line in 12 inch to the foot scale <laughs> and over 30 years as an independent consultant. He co-authored the history of the Jewett Car Company and has been involved in over 50 streetcar projects in the US and Canada. He has served as a director of the Hoosier Traction Meet and also serves on the board of the American Public Transportation Association. And Jim is joining us all the way from Colorado tonight for this presentation about Johnstown. Uh, were it not for the sharp climb of the Pittsburgh Railways Company's Fine View Line, the Johnstown Traction Company's Morellville Line's steep grade at its outer end would certainly have been well, uh, more well known. As it is, the system is fondly remembered as the last of the small town trolleys. And again, at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with our presenter, but the chat box is open, so please feel free to enter questions and comments during the show. Jim can read through those at the end. And um, stay tuned, because after our question and answer session today, um, after the Johnstown portion, Jim has recently put together a brand new presentation of slides on Route 65, the Munhall Line on the last day of service in 1965. So um, we'll share some of those right after the question and answer session with Johnstown. So please keep your microphones muted and your videos turned off during the presentation so that our presenter has all the bandwidth available for the slideshow. All right, Jim, take it away. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, good to be here and uh, let's get started. Uh, some of you, as we get farther in, will probably recognize some of the, uh, recognize yourselves in one or more of the pictures. This is a combination of uh, trips that I made to Johnstown back in the mid and late 50s and includes the uh, PERC trip of January of 1960 and also, of course, the last day uh, of Johnstown. Brief history of Johnstown, horse cars began in 83, 1883. Johnstown flood killed uh, 2,200 people and also wiped out the system. It was rebuilt and electric pretty fast. 1910, the Johnstown Passenger Railway Company was merged and became the Johnstown Traction. They started a bus subsidiary in 1932, began uh, trolley bus service in 1951, which made them also the smallest system to operate all three modes. Last streetcar system, last streetcar simultaneously. The last streetcar ran in 1960, last trolleybus 1967, and it became Camtran in 1976. Uh, and one of their uh, buses is now, a series of their buses is now painted very much to look like car 350, which of course, Kristen, is in your museum, I believe. 
Okay, and it's the only wide gauge Johnstown car. Uh, taking it historically, the Dale line shown here up uh, in about the middle of the page going to the top was abandoned in 1940. And then the long Horner Street line, which uh, headed out toward Moxham, was converted to trolley bus 1951. Let's go next. There's a, uh, this one of the St. Louis, which one of the six of them which served the uh, Horner Street line. And those are virtually identical to the St. Louis that were built for Detroit and the last order for San Francisco. They're quite a, quite a big, big vehicle for Johnstown. Next. Here's, here's why Johnstown had such a good transit system so late. If you look over to the left and you look at the population, you notice from about 1930 through about 1955, they were well over 60,000 people. And that's because the steel mills that were there and the growth and the steady growth of the, of the system. Uh, the ridership, as you can see on the right hand side, and I couldn't get necessarily the same, uh, same comparisons, but from World War II peak of around 24,000, 24 million, they rapidly fell off to a 1950 peak of 14 million. 15 million, and now they're down, or in 1960, they're down to uh, less than less than 5 million. It's one of the fastest population declining cities in Pennsylvania uh, right now, unfortunately. But for a good 20 year period, it was a great place for traction. Okay, now that we've had the history lesson and there won't be any quizzes on it, let's move ahead. Next. <coughs> The uh, line was pretty complete for quite a while. The Winber line was cut back from Ferndale, or cut back to a shuttle from Ferndale, which is in the upper right-hand corner, to Ben's Creek in 1936, and the Ben's Creek line quit in 1957. However, a piece of it was retained uh, for another couple of years. So let's take a look at what that piece looked like. Kristen, next. There were four of us that got together and uh, chartered this car for I think the sum was like $6 an hour. And that included a, an inspector and a motorman. And so we left Mox and Barn and then uh, went uh, headed toward downtown, but then immediately reversed next. Went back through the crossover and next. Took the uh, bridge, which was still in operation, across Stony Creek, um, and it was it continued in operation up until the late 50s. Next, and we wound up at the loop at uh, Ferndale, and that stretch south of there was one where uh, we all got to motor. But this um, th th this was more common back then, certainly than it is today, but. Uh, Basically, our qualification test for us, since it was all private right away, was uh, you guys ever run one of these before? We naturally said yes when we had, and uh, with varying degrees of experience. So, uh, two guys went in the back of the car and uh, read their newspaper and chatted, and we proceeded to have a good hour or so running back and forth in the Ben's Creek line next. This was what the line looked like. It was down by the by Stony Creek, the highway running above it. And it was pretty much all private right away. Next. Notice the grade crossing to the left. Uh, that was, we did have to slow down and stop for that. And one personal story I'll remember, which some of you guys have certainly have been there, is I think for everybody that's run a car, it one thing that always happens once, and usually not more than that, is you, you blow the breaker. You misjudge where the pole is exactly, and you go through the breaker under power. Uh, on 311, that breaker box was right up, seemed like it was right in your ear, but it was actually a foot and a half away. But uh, that was where I had my experience with doing that. Next. <clears throat> Here's the grade crossing again. You can see the end of the line down there always. 
and we changed ends and we're heading back um, to the next. And there we are with uh, our motorman, who, uh, whose name was Mr. Long, and everyone called him Shorty, of course. And the three, three of us, and then the one I'm behind the camera. All right, let's move move on. Next. Well, one thing I should mention, uh, this is taken about a, about a year and a half later when 311 had its uh, eye patch in for about a year. But off that, that second story there is one that I find out, and I thought we were unique, but uh, that, that was where the four of us hung out in the evening. And uh, this is a Johnstown was very hospitable at the time. Um, that's where we got to sleep, unrolled our sleeping bags. That was a union meeting room. So, uh, and the guys had their lockers up there, so they'd come in and tiptoe a little bit. Of course, uh, they, were, they were running hour cars after midnight, so whenever one of those came in, they'd be go to the window, throw open the sash, and take a, try to take a picture, at least look at the car. Next. All right, the other line that was abandoned pretty early was Southmont, which is down in the south. You can see that in the yellow. Well, it was abandoned in 1954 from the junction with the Roxbury line on up to the top of the hill due to a landslide that tended to block everything up. Next. <clears throat> this is uh, Shorty down at the junction with the uh, Roxbury line uh, with 311. Next. And here's two shots. Um, these were taken later. And the uh, 352 was taken in January, I believe, on that trip. And the one of 407, that was uh, probably taken earlier, and that will be a regular uh, uh, car. And you can tell it was still in active service, not to the South Line destination sign, of course, but because of the Pepsi Cola sign. That was one of those things where Pepsi had a great deal with the Johnstown Traction Company, just about every car at one time or another sported a Pepsi Cola sign in the front or in case of the 350s at both ends. Next. And this is getting ahead, but this is the last day when we pretty well had that uh, junction of the old South Mount Line and the Roxbury Line jugged up. Uh, it was 352 and it's probably 311 and then 350 and then BCC further down the hill, which would be a revenue crowd. Next. Okay, and the last piece that was kind of, it, it, it had been cut to one franchise run in 1953, and that was cut out in 58, but the track and wire stayed to the last day of service, as you can see. That line came off down at the very bottom and ran down to Oakhurst. Ran down to Oakhurst. The shuttle off of the uh, elbow line. Next. And that's the intersection where the uh, Oakhurst shuttle started. Um, 350, that would have been uh, earlier. You notice the Studebaker sitting over there. <clears throat> that intersection was one that going through it and then changing ends and then coming back and going straight in to the lower right hand corner uh, was one that usually left traffic in just a mess. As you can see, it wasn't signalized. Next. This is uh, 311 coming back from, and you use that same track to go straight down Corinne, and then 350 on Corinne Street headed down toward the end of the line. Very uh, short shuttle, but uh, a lot of fun. Next. And here we are at the end of the line, um, just about. Uh, you can see the end of the track there. Again, if there's anybody in the audience who uh, conducts, does a lot of safety with modern streetcars, they're probably terrified as well as should be. I'm sure that uh, cars slid off the end of that from time to time. Next. And here we have a couple of, uh, now the this is the same car at the same location, but shows you what you can do without having to be an expert in uh, in Photoshop. 
because you, the car was moved forward a little bit. It's, uh, as you can see, right up against the end of the track. And the pile of dirt were at least several people are watching the progress of the car, uh, making sure it doesn't hit anything. And I think, if I remember correctly, the gentleman in the, uh, the right-hand window, as he's looking out, was a fellow named Chuck Benjamin, who I believe was quite active in PERC. This would have been the January 1950, 1960 trip, 59. <clears throat> Some of us felt that J JTC was getting their, uh, a good portion of their revenue from fan trips. Anyway, moving right along next. Here's what pretty much was left as of June 1960, the end of operation. And we'll cover all of those lines. Morellville down at the bottom, then going clockwise, Coopersdale, Franklin, um, Moxham, Ferndale, and Roxbury. And then the income. Okay, next. The uh, hill that we mentioned at the beginning started down at the bottom of the outbound loop on the Morovo line. This is 350, uh, st stuck at the bottom, that stuff was sitting at the bottom. <clears throat> what they would do is no more than one car at a time could be on the hill. And that was both for safety and I suspect maybe also because of the power requirements. That, that hill was Pretty doggone steep. Next. And this is a repeat, but here we are up at the top or at the outer end of the loop, and then it headed off to the east and then back south. A fairly large loop. Next. This is um, why, well, this is the this is 311 uh, on the fan trip. Crossing headed uh, to the east and crossing one of the side streets there. Next. And now we're coming back down toward the bottom of the loop where we rejoin the outbound track. Next. Pretty much the same location, but uh, uh, maybe up a little further. Next. And here we come. Now this one I believe was taken the actual last day because two things, one there's trolley wires still up, or the track was trolley wires up, and two is I think that uh, of the times here, 311 wore that headlight only on the last day. Next. And here we are at the junction of the Morellville line, and that's 311 coming off of that. And straight ahead is the Coopersdale line, which had some of the best track on the whole system because it had been rebuilt right after World War II. And remember, this is only 15 years after World War II. Next. The Coopersdale Loop um, from the PCC. And note that the housing is uh, fairly, this is a fairly common housing stock all around Johnstown. Coopersdale Loop. And it was right next to the Coopersdale car house. And that's the ne next picture. And that next. This is what it looked like in 1956 when the cars were still there. This is a couple of 300s and 200s. Um, very interesting collection and made you want to get in there and sort of collect things. But that had to wait a little bit. All right, coming back again next. Oh, okay, there we are. Now we, that was a couple of years later. In fact, that was taken right at the day of abandonment. Uh, the truck itself is an antique, and you can see other kind of trucks back there. I think some of us managed to get a few things that uh, some of us still have and stored away. I like to next. <clears throat> Here's 311 again, and this is heading in toward the center, the central business district. And we've got several slides of that. The next one, next, shows the Johnstown Stadium, which for a city of 60,000 is pretty impressive. But they have a pretty good class A ball park, ball team. And this is the PCC revenue car outbound, and the Stream to the right is Stony Creek. The stream to the left is the Little Conamore. Uh, next. 
And here again, we just I just turned around and uh, that's looking up after we pass the junction. You can see bits of the steel mills and the steel couplings on the side. Uh, lots of the, that stretch for miles up there for the final river. Next. And here we have another PCC, and in the background, he's got the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge, uh, which the next slide shows a train on that. And that is an amazing bridge because it was built back in the 1800s. And that is the bridge against which the uh, debris that had floated down, had come down the Little Panama River to the right day of the Johnstown flood, it sort of dammed up against that bridge. It didn't knock the bridge out, but then it caught fire. And a lot of the deaths from that from the Johnstown flood were because of the fire from the bridge, and that must have been something else. Next. Here you see another shot of the baseball stadium um, with one of the 300s coming by, again bound for, down, for downtown. And downtown is just off to the left on this slide. And we'll, go, we'll have a couple of shots of that next. This is a PCC on what is the, what was the uh, Johnstown Central Business District loop. Um, and the next shot, next, is 311 in the same position. That was taken, uh, that was taken one of the four of us who had a fan trip. And you can see the valley. Uh, the, the hill behind it, uh, a lot of that's where the help the flood becomes so important and also control the way the Johnstown is going. Next. Much of this is gone now. The park off to the right <coughs> um, is still there, but most of the stores have changed in the, uh, the number of people. I don't think it's been that great for years. Next. <coughs> There's another one at 350 in the downtown area. Now they, there was uh, there were a couple of crossings of trade of railroads, and the other uh, electric line is in the next side, which is the Panama and Black Lick, and that would they serve the steel mills, and they would sort of uh, train there to sort of wander across the crossings from time to time. You had to watch out for them. Uh, about the time this particular train passed by, next. <clears throat> so, well, so 356 going the other direction and across the track and then turning on into downtown. Um, the Franklin line wasn't really in, op wasn't in operation when we made our first trip. And the next slide shows why. Off to the left, you can see that the bridge is being replaced. And because of that bridge, you had an up and over crossover, which was the first one of those I'd ever seen, but I'm sure many of you have had the experience of being going up and over. Uh, that bridge was completed in early 1959, and thus became one of the last bits of new trackage in Johnstown. And why the State Highway Department was willing to do that is something that's beyond me. Next is another shot of the bridge. And the approach coming off on the uh, downtown side. And the line <coughs> headed off uh, across that bridge, then turned right, went up the hill, and uh, turned left and went on down to Franklin Loop. The last, next, the last couple of uh, blocks of that were after it went back to single track. And you notice that parking is limited, so some people took advantage of the street parking. Next, here's one of the cars on the single track. Again, you can see how the hills are climbing right behind, the, right behind me. In that. Uh, next, this is the Franklin Loop, and we had nothing behind it. It uh, went through the little town of Franklin and came out on the far side and uh, went around the loop, and that was it. Next. Not a whole lot, uh, not a whole lot left after you pass through Franklin. Next, <clears throat> here's an interesting one: the uh, K. Hartley 
dress manufacturing company. Now, we talked a little bit about the steel mills and all of that rough tough stuff, but uh, Kay Hartley was quite a big manufacturer of dresses. And this is coming in on the uh, Franklin line. And they stayed around and uh, actually are still in business according to, according to the internet. Car that you have here moved down to the to your left, and then it turned and went over the river and, and across it. Next, and here you see that. Once it got across the kind of on black lick, it turned again. Next, and headed into downtown. Now the next next slide. <coughs> shows the rear of one of the PCCs. And the reason I, I wanted to put this in was because you can see in the distance one of the many, many sheds that went all the way up and down the little Conneaut River and were basically steel fabricating places where, where the mills themselves. Next. And here's 311 in downtown. Um, and again, that uh, park which you might have seen in the earlier slide is is off there to the right. Uh, again, lots of people, lots of uh, school stores, and none of that's there today. Next. This, here, we, here we're heading across the uh, across Stony Creek and headed out toward uh, Roxbury. Um, that's one of the fifties came across. Now, if you're in the mood for pizza, we've got uh, some things there. <clears throat> Great little pizza store. Um, I don't remember whether we ever ate there, but it's, it's handy. And a bus, one of their Jimmy's, and a street car. Next. This is a little farther out. Um, again, the line is 355, in that case, a fan trip car, when we were headed for Mox and Barnes. Uh, you see Stony Creek off there to the right, and you can see these, these cars, this series of cars were actually 20 of them, I believe, in 350 and 369. They were all built by St. Louis in 23 and 24, uh, and they had a unique truck, which, and the reason I know it's unique is because I have a car body of one of these. I'm trying to find a truck for it, even Rich Wagner never made one of that, of that particular truck, at least to my knowledge. Next. And here we've got a car headed for Ferndale. Um, I love the little old car sitting over there to the right and the much newer Ford over to the left. But this was, uh, again, what you see in the, in the back was a, one of the big mill buildings. Next. <clears throat> this is the junction of the line that goes off to the right to, to Moxon and Ferndale. Um, this connecting track is the one that connects from the car barn at Moxon up and turns, as he turns and goes up to uh, Roxbury, which I suspect was used at the first run of the day. That was about it. Next. Here we have two cars passing. This is as we're leaving the river and heading up the hill a little bit and heading toward Roxbury. Next. Here's 311 climbing the hill at Roxbury. Um, this is supposedly center of the road running. Um, I think it's an interesting highway and uh, interesting track, but you do get up to the top there. And Roxbury was like a little engine you could. You got up to the top and then you had your loop right in the only piece of background. <clears throat> and that was it. That was where Roxbury just sort of ended. Almost as if it had gotten tired, tired from climbing the floor and decided to quit them. Next. Here's another shot of the, the famous junction of the South Mountain Line. You can see a bunch of the fans, and here we've got not one, but two PCCs and uh, two Bantrick cars. Next. You saw earlier the picture of the uh, private right away coming up the hill. Well, it, it turned to a nice paved street the last couple of blocks, and this is the 
revenue car coming up the hill and getting ready to go around the loop and head back in town. Next. We've got a series of shots taken at the Rochford Loop. And you'll be able to see by the, some of the houses and buildings that we have. Uh, first one is uh, 350, Pittsburgh Garden, coming around the uh, loop. The second one next, frame yeah, 311, with the Ben Street sign. And you notice the house, which is the same one, and the uh, waiting shelter, which is off just below the yellow brick building. Um, uh, get an idea of how the loop is um, The board's kind of interesting too. <clears throat> Next. And finally, 352. Small cars. That may have been the uh, only park and ride lot in, uh, in Johnstown. Um, a lot of nice looking cars. That Buick back there. There's some others. Next. All right, let's not forget the incline because that is an incline of superlatives. Construction in 1890, and it was uh, so that the, at least some of the people could be looked to the flood the flood waters in case there was ever a big flood. Uh, it was built by Cambria Ironworks in Johnstown, which later became back in steel, opened in 1891, and today is owned by Camtron. The line's 867 feet long, which is a length of travel. Vertical rise is 71% here, which is pretty amazing. Steepest incline in the world is still there as vehicles. And naturally, next, we had to uh, try that out. So that's a, we don't know, that's a 1953 in the back. And I know that because that was the car we came out on. And so that's what it was. Next. This is looking up the hill. And Admittedly, we got it a little bit low, but uh, it's pretty impressive. Uh, next. There you have it looking, looking down on the bridge. The line was completely rebuilt. It was owned by the city of uh, uh, South North for quite a while. And uh, when they sold it, they gave it to Camtran, sold it to Ballard, and got completely rebuilt. To the, uh, over a few years. Next. And there, that looks out from the top of the incline is sort of a tour shot you have to grab when you've got a chance. But again, look at the steel mills that were there and it's all gone now. And the baseball down there. Next. Well, as I said, the last last power started coming back to the barn, which meant for 18. 93 when it was electrified to 1960 when it ended. So we had the, uh, the farm on Bond Street and then next the uh, snowball had still, was still in civil defense paint. That was back inside the barn. Next. And the PCC that had uh, been decorated. All set up for the last car for the fairly well, fairly well for Remus Lee. And the final slot next. That was the, uh, that was an order, it wasn't shorty, but it was an orderman and his wife, and I believe his daughter. Daughters. So that, folks, is Johnstown. Now, how many of you raise your hand, I guess, or, or Wait something in the chat room or on one of those trips. I will let everyone unmute themselves and answer that question in just a second. Um, so think about that. Uh, and we definitely want you to let us know if you were um, around in Johnstown during any of those photos. Um, thank you so much, Jim. And we'll get back to the Q&A in just a second. Yeah. But I wanted to jump in really quick before we wrap up and let everybody know that we have some really interesting things happening here at the museum in uh, the fall. Fall theme Fridays, this Friday, you can take a, a tour called Yinzer Trolleys, Transit of Western PA. And on October 30th, we'll have one called Off the Rails, The Fascinating Second Lives of Our Collection Post-Abandonment. 
um, which will focus on trolleys that became other things after they were trolleys. Uh, we have another digital presentation coming up October 23rd, Lost Trolley Parks of Western PA, which some of you may have seen during our virtual West Penn Trolley Meet. And then we'll even have some Halloween programming um, for adults and for kids on Halloween, which is a Saturday this year. Um, let's see. So I am gonna let everybody unmute themselves allow participants to unmute themselves. So if you have a comment or a question for Jim, or Jim, if you would like to pose a question again to the audience, go ahead. I think Jim has unmuted, or Jim has muted himself. But... <laughs> okay, oh. there we go. <laughs> so was anybody around in Johnstown uh, during, those, during those fan trips? Yes. All right. Sound is on now. John McGrew, did you have some, were you around then? Did you have something to say? Yes, I was on several of those trips. That was always a uh, real enjoyable opportunity to go over and ride trolleys in Johnstown. Sure. And I think I heard somebody else say they were there too. Uh, this is Bram. I uh, I with, went to Johnstown with my granddad uh, late in, on a late fan trip that was on a PCC car, and uh, all I remember is that I was really interested in in uh, in trolley switches, and so I came home with four rolls of film and probably two pictures of trolley cars, and the rest of it was street trackage. So uh, I was only about 12 years old at the time, so uh, I learned a lesson in photography from him. What not to shoot. <laughs> awesome. How do we get our pictures up, uh, our video pictures up? Uh, you can click the um, bottom left of the screen should have, I'll go ahead and unshare here really quick so that we can see everybody uh, Brady Bunch style. There we go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. now, or do you, how do we get on there? Do we uh, share um, at the bottom left of your screen, you should see something that says uh, start video. If you would like to... to uh, it says you cannot start video because the host has stopped it. Oh, I will let you do that. Ask to start video. Okay. <laughs> Come on now. Yeah, if I turned your video off, hey. the beginning, then, I'm, then it might uh, have some problems coming back on. But there. Greetings from Australia. Hello. Oh. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, you, I should be upside down, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> now, nobody leave because after this Q&A, we do have some slides from Route 65, the Munhall line, but um, I want to address any Johnstown questions first before we, before we move along. Um, the, uh, couple, a couple of things from my end of the world. The, uh, I'm assuming that the, the, the barn where all the, the stuff was, uh, the, what was it, not the Moxham barn, the other one, I, I've forgotten it. The, um, was a lot of, was there much equipment saved out of that by other museums when they uh, removed all the cars out of that storage barn? Yeah, the uh, 300s, uh, boy, a huge number of those were saved. I think Brantford had one, uh, West Penn, of course, or Penn, Pennsylvania Trial Museum has one. Oh, yeah, I'm aware of all those. I, I meant the, the the stuff that was at the old storage barn, the, the, all those, the cars that were stored there out of service, the 200s and all that sort of stuff. Was that, no. I know that none of the 200s were saved, but no. was any of the equipment saved from them? Probably. Uh, some of the pieces were, I have a gong from one of the 200s, and I also have oh, yeah. a couple of destination signs, that sort of thing, but uh, bogey was a little much to get in the back of Nick's Plymouth. Yeah. I know, actually, I, hey, Greg, this is Steve Lodge. Uh, I know Branford made a few trips in, in like 59 or 60 after the end of service, and they bought a lot of spare, spare equipment. They bought – my dad, uh, for those who don't know, my dad restored 356 at Branford. That's what got me into it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I know Sorry. Branford bought, I think it was a spare set of trucks and a bunch of other equipment from Johnstown after, after uh, service ended. I've had the privilege of running 356 at Johnstown. It's, uh, sorry, at oh, wow. uh, Branford, I beg your pardon. I'm not that old. Gotcha. <laughs> but the, uh, um, we've actually got 
a pair uh, a pair of Johnstown PCC trucks here in uh, in Australia. So uh, wow. that yeah, they came via Brussels. Mm -hmm. That the you could tell they were uh, ex because there were you know that there was two lots that went to Brussels. There was the Johnstown cars and the Kansas City cars. The Kansas City cars uh, trucks went to um, had the super resilient while the um, Johnstown had the, the standard resilient wheels, so it was quick, um, an easy way to pick them straight away. We have a question. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Dave, and I grew up in Johnstown, and I remember riding the streetcars going to, pro to uh, elementary school. But the question I have is the gentleman had talked about the Franklin line. And um, there was, I believe, uh, another line that paralleled the Franklin line that was across the river in the borough of Conema. And our family legend was that the, that the streetcar actually went from Conema, really on the side of the hill. It was kind of elevated. And then it went down into town. And I'm wondering when was that line discontinued? Because I know people, our family used to talk about taking that line from Conema, which was up across the river from Franklin, all the way to Winber. You could, you could do it with a couple of transfers. That line was one of the interurban lines. And I, I wish I would have had more time because uh, the interurban history of uh, of Johnstown is pretty amazing too. They had the one line that, that went up exactly as you described. That ended in uh, the eastern end of downtown. So the, then your folks would have had to transfer to right. the to the Johnstown traction, which then you could go up until 1937 or so. You could go all the way to to, uh, to um, Winber. To Winber. Okay. Interesting. So I know even when I was growing up in the, in the, in the 50s, that line was obviously abandoned, but people still walked the, uh, the area. They still, the tracks, I guess, were gone, but they still walked where the, um, there was like a trail where you could walk where the, where the uh, uh, trolley tracks used to be. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, I don't know whether that's still there or not, but I know that that, that was the conversion. And I think there were some politics involved because right after the 1936 flood, which was another major one, uh, that's when the Winber line had been kind of partially washed out. And that's when they decided they wanted a bus and uh, a modern bus, you know, that kind of thing. And Johnstown Traction just sort of cut back the thing to, uh, to uh, Ben's Creek. Uh, but that was because that was out of, the, I think it was the first place of any kind of magnitude outside of the city of Winber. Right. And then there was, there was also an interurban that went from Winber on south a ways. That went out very early, though, I think in the 20s, and somebody else may have had to correct me on that. Um, but, but that, uh, and as usual, there were a lot of people that had a lot of ideas about what you ought to be building in Johnstown in addition to what actually got built. Sure. Thank you. Are there any other? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Greg. Sorry, uh, the the gentleman that was running the show. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the name. Um, the uh, he mentioned that he had a um, uh, a, car, a an O scale car body that he wanted the the trucks for for the uh, unique trucks. Yes. Um, oh, there you are, Jim. Sorry. Um, the U.S. Uh, now th they were E60, uh, St. Louis E64 trucks that they had under those cars. I, I, I assume that's what you were talking about. Not sure what they are. They're St. Louis truck, but yeah. I, they, it was not reproduced in O scale, as far as I know. Yeah, uh, there, there are. Um, the oh, the there Q, are. Q Car Company uh, uh, produces them. So Quentin finally made them. Now, yeah. My yeah. next question is, how long does it take to get a pair? Well, the the other option the other option is if you can't, um, I've I've actually got some side frames if you uh, that I cast in resin, um, if you uh, if you wanted side frames and put them on your own, uh, on your own trucks if or on something else if you wanted to. But certainly Quentin makes the 
their, their, their E64 is the, 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 the St. Louis E64 track. Okay, thank you. That, You're welcome. That makes my whole trip worthwhile. <laughs> they are very attractive cars. We actually had the, uh, yeah, we actually had the, the, the pleasure of, um, of riding uh, 352 at, um, at, um, uh, in Washington um, at Silver Spring. Unfortunately, of course, the, the, not long after that, um, they suffered their second fire and lost that and their pre-PCC pre car as well. Uh, and it just they just spent a fortune on restoring uh, 352 as well. Well, the, yeah, the terrible loss there, I always thought was a silver sightseer. And I had, oh. I had the chance to ride that, and that was what a modern street car would have been back then. Well, just to, just as an aside, I know it's, it's right off topic, but uh, now that they've actually got two um, uh, post-war um, standee window PCC cars there, it would probably be advantageous for maybe 1540 to be uh, restored as the, you know, as a replica of the silver sights here. Could be, could be. And uh, Rich from Atlanta says the cue car takes about eight weeks to produce a set of trucks. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right, I am going to, uh, we're gonna move on to our Munhall portion and then we can continue all of this um, after uh, uh, after that part of the slideshow, and it's much shorter. So um, it's about 16 slides, I would say. So um, Jim, if you would like to introduce it and take it away. And um, if you don't mind, you can turn off your videos, um, or if you want, um, above the video controls, there's a little, um, there's like a grid and then an equal sign and a bar and then a line. If you click that little line, you can hide everybody's face so that it doesn't interfere with the screen. So uh, Jim, take it away. Okay, uh, Munhall was one of, was a fascinating line. I'd been living in Pittsburgh about a month at that point. And a friend of mine said, well, it's the last day, let's go down. And as I recall, there were four or five other lines that were all abandoned that same day. So that's what I sort of decided, you know, that's what, what maybe uh, do a show on the Munhall line, Munhall Lincoln Place. Um, and a short show to try to keep it down. The line was almost entirely in city streets, but the two main streets were very narrow, as you'll see, Main and Interboro. So the line was largely single track of passing sightings, which in 1965 was something pretty amazing. You'll see some of those. It also had a lot of ups, ups and downs, so this line of sight wasn't always very good, and that's why they signalized them with very simple signals, you'll see a couple of those on the entering side of the sidings. Sidings were generally two car lengths long. And uh, the last day we had, as I recall, three cars plus a car in revenue service. So some of those were saw buys. Um, the line served steel workers and uh, lived in Munhall and Lincoln Place along both sides. The mill is now a shopping center, but uh, Munhall's population is almost the same was in 2000, and the Route 53, Pat's Route 353, runs largely on the same streets. So if you go down there and ride the bus, you can uh, see part of the line. Uh, I toyed with the idea of doing a Bill Volkmer and uh, putting out the Google Earth and seeing what you what's there. There are a couple places where you can, you can duplicate the uh, some of the slides you'll see. Uh, the cemetery is obviously there, although people are still dying to get in. But, uh, <laughs> that was coming. <laughs> but the, uh, there's a, as you'll see, there's a couple buildings that are still there that were there back in the late in the 60s. Um, and I put down three more references down in the bottom that have some additional pictures. Okay, so let's go, Kristen. Next. This was where we picked up and by that time of the PERC was the PRMA, and M54 was the uh, was one of the charter cars that we had. Um, so that's that's the start of it. I didn't take much along what's uh, along Eighth Avenue and Amity because there's not much to see over there. Although I wish now I would have taken some more. Next, this is up by the cemetery, and this is the southbound trip. So again, you can see the fans and you can see the switch over there. Uh, these are all little short sightings. 
this particular one happened to have the straight track and then the, the siding had been added to one side later, which made it even more complicated for motorists. Next. And here's the revenue car. Um, one of the first ones that was painted in the then new Pat's color scheme. And that's uh, again at the very top, by the very top of the sanitary area. Next. Oh, Here we are now. Th this has an interesting shot. The uh, the state store is now is still a liquor store, but of course it's not a state store anymore. And the building between Mellon Bank and the state store is the is still. Let's see. That's. That, 30, 40, many years later, 60, 50 years later, that's still the uh, the uh, post office, the Mun Hall. And you can see it's getting ready to boarding and the fan coming out and so on and so forth. Next. This is down at the other than I, we take a lot longer, by the way, coming back because there, there were, by that time there were two or three cars or street cars. This was a, a, another oddball track arrangement where the cars where the PCCs are were, went down and then from the right behind those trees, the 56 came in and then they shared the right of way down to uh, uh, Multani and Mulvani Street. Those two buildings in the background are, the, are two of them that I was referring to. I've got pictures of them in 1965 and pictures of them in 1961. Not that I took, but that were from some of the source books. And they were different owners and different uh, types of store, but they were still there. Next. And this is, this is one where the ECC is using a short stretch of the 56 to come down, and it will turn and go off to our right as we look at this picture, and then loop around and go back up the hill. And that piece of track, if you do get on Google Earth and look at it, it just looks like a cinder covered right away that uh, the track got pulled up and cars are driving on it uh, occasionally, but that's about it. And uh, the question there is I wonder if any of those youngsters turned into fans. Next. This is very typical of the parts that were street side, and it shows the two things I mentioned. One is how narrow the street is. You didn't park a lot of cars on there. Again, look at some of those great cars, the Oldsmobile off to the right. Uh, and you can see the street dro dropping off to the left down an alley. Uh, and to the right, the street's going, the home's climbing up the hill. So there were very, it, it's, a, it's a narrow street. Uh, passing sightings, and in 1965, that was rare. Next. This is the, uh, it's the top of the hill, and that's, uh, I want to say PayPal, but that's not quite right. The street going off to the left there is a little short one, and it connects with another street that comes over in front of the street car. Um, again, the, the right of way is kind of amazing. Next. Here's one of the passing sightings, uh, sharp curves and nice diamond switch there. Um, and the streetcar really crowds automobiles over to one side, as you'll see in a couple of pictures next. But you can see the signal up here, up there too. This is one that uh, I've tried. It, it, apparently, I believe the buildings are still there, but I am handy is, is not. And I thought that was neat. This is where this is now just into Mun into uh, Mun Hall. We've left Lincoln Place, and notice the poor couple in front of us who <clears throat> somehow decided to buck traffic. Uh, they're there for a while. But you had at, at this time we had the M2454 and two PCCs behind us, and the parade stretching out in front of us. And we'll see more of that next. The school is still there. It's now an elementary school. Not sure what it was at this time, but it looks a little grand for elementary school. Uh, maybe one of the locals will know that answer. But the, uh, we came down the hill and uh, again, notice the angles of the street are going all different ways. 
That's the way it was. On the, on the, uh, next. There's a parade. We uh, got in front of it at that point. And that's uh, all your, your required cheerleaders and flag players and the band behind it and all that. Kind of neat. It's a way to celebrate if you got to get rid of a secret. Next. Here you have uh, two of the fan trip cars and we're coming down the hill, which is lined as, as always with photographers. Again, I uh, doubt in this stretch of the street there's enough room to even have a car get around, let alone park. Next. This is the, uh, at the cemetery and you've got all three of the fan trip cars and a bus speaking in way, way over to the right. Um, and I thought this was an appropriate kind of way to end this whole series because there, there you are in the cemetery and the cars are headed, uh, all three of us headed up to the downhill and then up a couple more next. And uh, uh, it was late at night when I put this together. So <laughs> if anybody, you remember the Waskily Wabbit and then you, so that, that, that's all, folks. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks, Jim. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, is anyone on this Zoom, uh, does anyone remember uh, this particular date or was anybody there? Were you a, a kiddo in one of those photos? Let us know. <laughs> and I think everybody should still be able to um, unmute themselves if you'd like. And I'll go ahead and stop the share so we can see each other again. Um, but before we all scatter, I want to thank Jim again uh, for sharing not one, but two shows with us tonight. And I want to thank everybody for joining us. And especially thanks to those of you who uh, donated when you got your registered for your tickets today. Uh, we really, really appreciate that. Um, if you'd like to donate and you haven't already, um, you can visit patrolley.org slash support, which I did link in the chat a few minutes ago before Jim started his second presentation. Um, Thank you guys for joining us for this season, the fall season of Trolleyology. We will be back in early 2021. Wow. Uh, January and February, we're hoping to have some more presentations. We might do something like every other week this time so we can draw it out a little bit longer. So um, stay tuned for uh, early 2021 presentations. And if you are interested in giving a presentation, please let me know um, in your confirmation email that you got today. My, uh, you'll find my email address, assistant at patrolley.org or volunteer at patrolley.org. We had a couple people actually reach out after last week's presentation offering up some shows. So it's very exciting uh, that you guys are interested in presenting as well. And I see we have a comment or question in the chat for Jim. Was ridership down or was this just part of Pat's general dislike of streetcars? Well, when they got rid of the 68 and the 56 and the 55, there was, there was no reason to keep that one isolated four or five mile line over there. Uh, ridership is, I don't know what it is on the bus right now, but they're still running a bus over there with the uh, 25 minute headway. I believe 25 or 30 minute headway. And the line ran with, uh, I think it was 15 or 20 minute headway, even in the 60s. So I, I suspect this is a case where it was more just because it was the last line over there anywhere near a barn. Uh, but that was probably more the, more the issue because even running a bus line over there on those streets, which haven't changed much. I did go into Google Earth and, and follow the streetcar line. And even today, probably because of the tight hills on either side, it's, it's a very narrow two, two lane road. And I doubt there, there was any way you could, I, I would, even running a, as a Rich or a couple of guys that were my own experience, I wouldn't want to run much of a bus line down there, let alone a streetcar line. And six passing sightings in that distance is the same thing. That's another difficulty. And they certainly weren't going to rebuild the track. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm very familiar with the 65 line. I grew up along there. And, oh. and in fact, in probably a couple of those pictures, I'm in there somewhere. Um, I had graduated from high school shortly uh, 
before those that that big uh, weekend. I remember that. Um, one of the problems with the 65 car line was it was isolated. The on and off road the, 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 for the cars was uh, ridiculous. It operated at a Craft Avenue car house. So the cars would have to travel along the 64 car line all the way from Oakland through Swissvale, uh, Wilkinsburg, uh, North Braddock, into East Pittsburgh to actually get on the route. Uh, so we're looking at probably a one hour yeah. deadhead uh, on road, although Pittsburgh Railways never really wanted anybody to mm -hmm. deadhead. He sure. probably did an outbound 64 trip to East Pittsburgh and then he changed to a 65 and then, you know, mm -hmm. the cars were out there for the rest of the day. And then the problem was getting the operators their, their lunch breaks. Uh, they had uh, an operator uh, out of Craft uh, Avenue down to Homestead to relieve the operator. So he would have to ride a 68 bus back and forth. And that was like a 45 minute ride, which the operator was being paid for that time. So yep. very inefficient. Uh, and originally the 65 cars ended at the Munhall Loop. And that was the inbound end of the line. Uh, when they abandoned the 55 line, they extended them through Braddock and into East Pittsburgh using the old 55 trackage. But I used to ride that car a lot. And it was a very interesting line. I, I remember that. Uh, it, it was, <laughs> that's for sure. And Jim, you'll be interested to know that Chris is PTM's president. And Chris, you'll be interested to know that Jim just renewed his PTM membership. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, with uh, back in tw 2008, I had the, the pleasure of, uh, of visiting uh, Arden. And uh, it was, it, it's a fabulous museum. I'd have to say that um, uh, one of the one of the finest uh, streetcar museums in in the U.S. and uh, there's there's few. One of the things that uh, that I think that uh, street railway museums should uh, attain should aspire to is to recreate the atmosphere of the uh, of the street railway instead of just being uh, a streetcar museum. And and Arden certainly does that. And in fact. I think of the the only ones that come to mind that really sort of fit that bill is probably Arden, um, uh, Branford, and the tiny little one in um, uh, at Kelly Park in San, in San Jose, uh, where it, and this actually even though it's only a tiny little thing, it it actually recreates the whole atmosphere of the street railway and uh, but. Um, I also, I was surprised, one of the things that surprised me about uh, Pittsburgh was I lived in Canada for 12 months and I drove buses there. And um, but one of the things that surprised me about Pittsburgh was that it, it seemed as a, as a city, it's quite small. I expected it to be a lot larger, but when you get up on top of Mount Washington and you look down at the Golden Triangle, and it, it's quite an, a, a much different type of city than I thought it would be. And, you get to appreciate the difficulties it would have been to, to actually have a street railway system there. But, mm -hmm. uh, but one last thing, I, I don't want to hog up the whole thing, but one last thing, um, the, the museum that I belong to, I, I, I'm an ex, um, I was a motorman instructor in Melbourne and I actually, um, uh, I was a motorman on the Glenelg line in Adelaide, the, the, the remaining line then, the remaining line in Adelaide, there's, it's been ex re-extended since, but, when we had the, the original cars. Um, and it, I'm a member of the Ballarat Tramway Museum Society, which has got 1.3 kilometres of the original track from the original system still in use around the lake. And, um, and I train the motorman there. Um, the, uh, we've also, uh, in Bendigo, uh, there's one, about three quarters of one complete route that's still kept and operated as a tourist tramway and they've still got their original barn and everything else and they still run the occasional Bernie and uh, and that's in the middle of the street runs right through the heart of the city and that and and it's and the reason I bring all that up is that uh, like Johnstown was the last small town system in 
uh, in the US, Bendigo and Ballarat were the last small town systems in, in Australia. And, um, and that we lasted a little bit longer in uh, 71 in, in Ballarat and 72 in Bendigo. But, uh, but yeah, I, I think the Johnstown system was fascinating and, uh, and same with Pittsburgh. Mm. Well, J Jim, Jim uh, mentioned about driving buses down those narrow streets. Uh, <clears throat> I retired a number of years ago from the transit authority here in Pittsburgh. Mm. I started out driving buses and eventually when I got enough seniority, I moved over to the light rail system and spent most of my career there. Uh, but drove buses down those streets and we were driving 40 foot buses, 102 inch wide, which at the time were actually illegal outside of Allegheny County because they were wider than what PennDOT allowed on the state highways. Uh, and I could tell you for a fact, not just in Munhall, but I was mainly on the north side. Uh, we had several routes where when you had trolleys, you had passing sidings. And, and as Jim mentioned, uh, sight lines weren't always good. So at least these, these sidings were signaled. Well, when they got rid of the streetcars, you're driving buses down these roads. And the buses didn't have signals. You know, you, you, you had regular traffic signals. And I remember one particular place on the 16B, uh, Bellevue, uh, up at Wind, Windhurst and Cambrone off of Brighton Road. There was a narrow, you went up this narrow street, you had to make a very sharp left turn onto another narrow street, and then a right turn onto a main, main road. And it seemed that the scheduling department, uh, and I don't see George Gula on here tonight, so I, I can bash him because he worked at the scheduling department. They always arranged the inbound and outbound buses to meet at the worst possible places where you couldn't pass. And it got to the point where if you were a regular operator on that route, you knew when the bus coming in the other direction was going to be along or close to. And, and likewise, the, the, the driver on the, uh, the other bus knew you were going to be coming. So you would hold back a little bit, wait for him to come around the, the bad turns, the narrow corners. But every once in a while, you'd get somebody off the extra board that didn't know. And you'd get into a spot, you'd get jammed up, and there's parked <laughs> cars, there's nowhere to go. And you're cursing yourselves, oh, man, how am I going to get out of this one? And always managed to. And, uh, I remember one time uh, on uh, Perrysville Avenue, a particularly narrow street, I stopped to let someone off. And I kind of, we called it digging in between the parked cars to make way for the opposite bound bus to go. Well, I had already pulled out and this guy's coming in the other direction and he's coming down there hell bent for leather. And we're not going to make it. And he ended up taking out about three parked cars. I sat there. I pulled the, the parking brake. I, my hands are off the steering wheel, and I'm just watching it happen. And like I say, he took out about three or four parked cars. Well, of course, he got in trouble over that. And then he came to me, and he said it was my fault because I should have waited for him. I said, but I didn't see you coming. And you're the guy that was stepping on the, the, the gas pedal. You're the guy that was turning the steering wheel. You could have stopped. And if you would have stopped back there, there would have been room for me to pull out and get around you. But you continued to make your way through there, and I couldn't see why. Well, anyway, he got in trouble, and I didn't, so. It was a bit like, it was a bit like that uh, in, in Aurelia when I was driving in Canada on the, the buses there, and... Uh, in the, the middle of winter and uh, uh, in all the snow and ice. And uh, uh, it was fun and games. It was, it was a bit like dodging cars, you know? Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm lucky at 25 years, I never had an accident uh, that was considered to be my fault. I did have a car plow into the side of my bus in downtown Pittsburgh that she said she didn't see me. And then I got hit by a uh, car at a grade crossing on the light rail system. 
at like 4.30 in the afternoon. The lights were flashing and she claimed she didn't see me, but she hit dead center in the middle of the articulated uh, car. First thing they always say, I didn't see you. I didn't see you. Yeah, that's, that's what she said. And there was no damage done to my car. Her car was totaled. The, uh, the roof foreman came out, took some pictures and says, what are you waiting for? Get that car and get going. Look, I, I've, I've got to get going, but I just want to say uh, thanks for inviting me to, in, into this. It was great. Uh, I've got uh, a bunch of slides um, of Pittsburgh that were, um, oh, oh gosh, I, I think, look, I can't, oh, for the life of me, I can't remember where I got them from, but they're in areas that you don't normally see other, um, uh, uh, like there, there's a lot of, you see a lot of photos in a lot and, and tend to be the favorite spots, uh, whereas these tend to be areas that uh, you don't see in normal publications. Um, I'm going to, I'll dig them out and at some stage I'll get, when, especially when, uh, when the mail service gets back to normal, because at the moment I think everything it goes by rowboat between here and, and anywhere, anywhere else. But um, when things get back to normal, I'm happy to, to pass over those slides to the uh, PTM. So, um, great, great. So, sure. and sometimes those are the most interesting, those, you know, out of the way places that you don't normally yeah. Yeah, we're definitely considering, uh, for our trolleyology series, uh, which you guys were a part of today, we like to keep it kind of local or related to our collection. But we do have tons of people who have um, submitted presentations or ideas of things, you know, um, the British inner city, uh, what is it, one, one, uh, 125, one... I can't remember, but uh, people have submitted things for like Niagara Gorge Railway, oh, wow. uh, all sorts of stuff. So uh, we're definitely going to try and figure out a way to have maybe like a member night or a share your slides type night where everybody can uh, see some stuff that is just for fun and not generally related to our collection. But um, if you want to get if you want to get in touch with me, off, uh, you know, on the, by email, uh, maybe we can organize something if anyone's interested in something from down under. Sure. And sometimes we team up with other museums. We did that over the summer. Um, I see a couple people here who, who helped us with our uh, kind of museum community Zoom where everybody gave updates about what's happening at their museum, what they're working on, what they're excited about. Uh, so uh, hi, Joel and Matt and on and some other people I think were here too. So um, yeah, we like working with other museums too. So yeah. Um, and by the way, speaking of speaking of collections in museums, eight, that West Penn 832, what a stunning looking restoration. Uh, when I was there in 2008, I looked at that and I thought, gee whiz, you know, if it didn't have its, if it didn't have its trucks and equipment, why would you bother? <laughs> yeah, that's like bringing back something from the dead. Absolutely. Like we've done that too, but that, that was a monumental task, that one. I, I see John McGrew on here. Are you related to Mac McGrew? Yes, that was my father. And uh, I was on that original trip down to Arden on the, when the first three cars came down. He got me into streetcars actually long before that. So I've been a streetcar fan all my life. Uh, and I always enjoyed having trips over to Johnstown. I, I remember um, your dad uh, when, he, when he was working on the, uh, for uh, what was it, Iron City Brewery doing the old frothing slosh commercials with <laughs> That's right. Yekberg down in the tied yeah. to the track in front of uh, 40. I wrote an article on that. I was there when that was, when that was happening. Okay. Yeah. I wrote an article for a newsletter on that, that uh, I thought the situation was pretty funny. My dad basically was a, a real teetotaler and uh, yet he ended up on the uh, beer can label for old frothing slosh, which is kind of a funny situation. It was the only beer in the world with foam on the bottom. That's right. The development <laughs> light beer. The pale stale ale. Pale stale the ale. On the bottom, right. Brewed with pure mountain crud water. That's right. <laughs> uh, I wanted to comment on the Johnstown uh, pictures also. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I had several very nice trips over to Johnstown when I was growing up. And uh, one of the highlights of that was uh, you, you touched on the uh, showed pictures of 311 <clears throat> and commented about people uh, being given a chance to operate the car. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if it was that same trip or, or a similar one, but yes, that was one of the ones at age 11, 
I was given the opportunity to uh, run the car out there. That was my first time in running a streetcar, and it was a real uh, delight for a, a youngster to be able to do that. And uh, at the other end of the scale, the last trip there, 1960, I guess I was uh, 14 at the time. And um, uh, I'll put in the claim for possibly being the last uh, passenger on the Johnstown line because I was on the was the last person at the back platform of the last car coming in. So uh, I would think that would make me the last passenger. Oh. Wow. That was a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Very, very, very interesting presentation. Really yeah. good job, Kristen. Really good job, Jim. And Jim, yeah. those were uh, your recently digitized slides, right? Yep. Uh, just, uh, and I, le I learned a lot about digitizing. I'll tell you guys if, guys, if you haven't done some of that, it's amazing what modern te techniques, as, as Walter knows, will do to bring back old slides. I have some. Yeah, I used to shoot a lot of ANSCA film because at the time it gave very accurate colors. It wasn't the red photochrome or the green ectochrome, but then they faded a lot. And you can really bring those things back, modern technology. The other, the other thing I'd mention is you, you guys had it really tough with a 102-inch wide bus in Pittsburgh. When I ran the Rhode Island system, we had, we had were the last property to have 96-inch wide buses, I think. Well, we had we weren't the last, but uh, I know we were the only, we were the first and probably one of the only ones that ordered 96 inch wide advanced design buses when they came out. Well, it's funny because when Port Authority got their first uh, batch of uh, fishbowl, 102 inch wide fishbowls, uh, they put one on display in downtown Homestead in front of uh, First Federal Bank. And they were, they were telling everyone, well, we just brought this down here for display. You won't see any of those running in this area because the streets are too narrow. Ha, that's all you have running now. Yeah. Okay, I gotta go, guys. Thanks very much again. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Jim, this was my first uh, trolleyology uh, presentation to see and uh, I was very pleased with it. Thank you. Thanks for coming and thank you to everybody for coming. I hope you can join us again in January, February. Uh, stay tuned to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum's webpage. Um, you'll see some scrolling banners at the top there and one of them will be trolleyology. And when we do have a schedule, we'll post it there so that everybody can see and sign up. Um, do we have any other questions or comments for Jim before we wrap up here? All right. Just thank Are you. <laughs> Thank you guys again for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks, Jim. Bye.